way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Eden. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. They said, we're sick of the same old thing all the time, begin to complain. And the Lord always gets angry when his people complain. And verse 6 said, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld a serpent of brass, he lived. And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in Obal. I want to preach to you tonight on the subject, Look and Leo. That's a famous sermon preached by Brother Michael Grant that many of you might remember, but I, many years ago the Lord dealt with my heart about this scripture, and I'd like to bring it to you. Here we find an amazing story in the Old Testament. And one of the sad things that I run into among Christians tonight is their constant preoccupation with the New Testament and almost total ignoring and rejection, in some cases, of the Old Testament. Some folks now take it to the opposite extreme and only believe the Old Testament and do not accept the New Testament. An Orthodox Jew, for an example, has only 39 books in his Bible, chronologically arranging them ending in Second Chronicles. And they reject the New Testament as being the Word of God. But on the other hand, you have a lot of folks who just accept New Testament doctrine, such as the Church of Christ, for example. They believe the Old Testament, but they believe the Old Testament is not relevant today, and that's why they won't have a piano in the church. Because no uh, instruments is mentioned in, in the uh, New Testament. Just songs and hymns and spiritual songs. Of course, that's ridiculous, and but anyway, that's to the point where some people uh, reject the Old Testament, accept new, and vice versa. Now, the actual truth is this evening that both the Old Testament is the Word of God and the New Testament is the Word of God. Somebody said one time, they was talking to this Church of Christ elder, and they began to talk about uh, all these things, and uh, they began to ask him some things, and, you know, begin to talk about baptism. They believe that baptism saves, and um, at least the blood, they say, washes your sins away when you're baptized in water, and if you're not baptized in water, that your sins are not washed away. And a fellow was talking to him, and they said, uh, the man said, well, what about the thief on the cross? And the Church of Christ elder said, oh, he was baptized. And they said, how do you know? And they said, well, he was a former disciple of Jesus, and he had backslid and just rededicated his life on the cross there, and got in. We know that he was baptized. He said, hey, you, he, the Bible don't uh, say that. Where do you get that? He said, well, the Bible don't say that he wasn't baptized, so he must have been. And the preacher told him, he said, did you know Simon Peter shot his mother-in-law with a forty-five pistol? And the guy said, you're crazy. Where did you get that? He said, well, the Bible don't say he did, so he must have, right? And he said, you can't, you can't listen to people like that. They're about, uh, they're a lot like somebody's three sheets in the wind drunk and don't know what they're talking about in the Word of God. Now, if Church of Christ doctrine is right, they still are wrong on the thief on the cross. Because if that thief on the cross got saved and then got baptized in water and got his sins washed away and then backslid and rededicated, got saved again on the cross, if he had to get baptized in water to get saved the first time, he'd have to get baptized in water to get saved that second time and the poor guy still went to hell. But that's not true. He he didn't get baptized in water and he went with par to paradise with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a, that's a problem you get into when you start rejecting Paul part of the Word of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Now here's the way it goes. Preachers, get this through your head. Here's the way it goes. It goes like this. 
The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. You understand that? The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed in types and shadows. The New Testament is the Old Testament uh, opened up. It, so you understand that this evening. It's There's many types and shadows. They're interwoven and you can't believe one and have one without having the other. They complement each other. They comment on each other. For example, who would try to understand the book of of um, Daniel without understanding a little bit about Revelation and vice versa. Who would attempt to understand the book of Hebrews without knowing something about Leviticus and Numbers? So the Old Testament is New Testament concealed. The New Testament is Old Testament revealed. And in these stories in the Old Testament, we see many types and shadows that are brought to light in the New Testament. And you look back and say, well, I'll be. There's why God said that back there in in the Old Testament. Let me give you some examples by introduction. Of course, we see the story that I mentioned this morning about Abraham in Genesis 24. Abraham, a picture of God the Father. Isaac, a picture of God the Son. The servant, Eliezer, a picture of the Holy Ghost. Going to a far country to get a bride for the Son. That's the church. The Holy Ghost calls out the bride. He takes the bride over to where Jesus is. I just uh, heard somewhere that Nowadays, you know, we had a nice wedding here at Wednesday night. It was a real blessing. And boy, it was a real blessing. If you missed that, it was real good. And I'll tell you, old Tater just made that thing, didn't he? But I'll tell you, brother, they, we have this. The, the, the groom always comes out here. He's here with the preacher. And the bride marches up there to where he and the officiant is. That's the preacher. And brother, I heard somewhere that, that now they're saying that the new modern day thing is that the groom marched down down the aisle with his parents and the bride marks down the aisle with her parents. That's not right. That, that's, that's wrong. That, that is done that way for a picture. It's a type in the Word of God. When, when God, when the church goes to heaven, Jesus ain't down here and goes up with us, brother. He, we go to meet Him. We go to meet Him. And brother, that's the way that bridegroom stands here, waits on that bride to come down that aisle. We see it all the way through the Word of God in Joseph's story. Did you know that Joseph is one of the greatest types of Christ of anybody in the Bible? 150 or some odd particulars. Joseph's life is a picture of Christ. If you know anything about the New Testament, you can't read that story of Joseph without it just thrilling the daylights out of you. You're, I mean, you're reading through there like this. And you say, look here, the twelve tribes, sun and the moon, mom and daddy represent. Joseph dreams that his brothers come one day and bow down to him. Now, you know what that's a picture of? He's a picture of Jesus. His twelve, uh, eleven brothers are pictures of, the twelve brothers are the twelve tribes of Israel and that they're going to one day bow down before him. And they hated him. They were jealous of him. What's that a picture of? He came into his own, his own received him not. That's why you can take your Old Testament and lead a Jew to Jesus Christ if you know your Bible. And brother, you take that thing out. Oh, Joseph, he was betrayed by his brothers. And he was in a type, he was killed. They put blood on his coat. They put him down in the pit. A picture of the death and the burial of Jesus Christ. But the Bible says, but God was with him. And see, the Lord brought Joseph up out of the Pit. Picture of what? The resurrection of Jesus. He went into a far country, was exalted to the right hand of the king, and was ruled over all of Egypt. A picture of Jesus now going back to heaven, sit on the right hand of God. And then one day, here come them old boys bowing down again, just like they're going to do at the end of the tribulation. They're going to bow down. And, he, and the Bible said the second time, he was made known unto his brethren. He came up first time, they he didn't know who he was. But the second time, he'll be made known unto his brethren. We see that story of Moses. How let the children of Israel come out of Egypt's bondage. Moses, picture of the law. Moses, a type of Christ. Joshua, a type of Christ. Crossing over Chile, Jordan. All that stuff. The manna that fell in the desert every day is a picture of you picking up your Bible and reading it every day and feasting on new manna from heaven.
different from the Word of God. The Red Sea is a picture of their baptism. They were baptized in the cloud and in the sea after they left Egypt's bondage. Their journeyings in the wilderness. A picture of this life as we're on our way to Canaan's fair and happy land. I like that story over there where they was all thirsty. And they started saying, we ain't got nothing to drink. We ain't got nothing to drink. We ain't got no water. We ain't got no water. Can't take a bath. Can't do this. And old Moses, bless his heart, he had a headache that day. And him and his, him and his, they, him and his wife wouldn't had an argument or something. And she they was getting on his nerves because uh, he married that old Ethiopian and some of them, some of them didn't like it. And uh, I don't see how he liked it either. But anyway, I'll tell you what, brother, uh, that's, uh, that's another story. But anyway, here he come. And he, he come out here and he come over here and he said, Lord, these people are driving me crazy. God, how about calling me to another church somewhere? Where would they go? And the Lord said, cause this I'm the only church in the world. And they're called out. This is a called out assembly. If you're going to pastor one, this is it. And Moses said, oh, do I have to? And the Lord said, yeah. He said, they're wanting water. What am I going to do? And the Lord said, what's that in your hand? And he said, that's my rod. And the Lord said, you see that big old rock over there? He said, you go over there and you take that rod and you go and you hit that rock. And, and Moses said, uh, how about letting me hit old sister and flap jaws with it? And he said, no. Now Moses, you better watch that timber, son. It's going to get you in trouble. And he said, but Lord, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. But boy, she gets on my nerves. You yank that gripe, gripe. She don't go home with nothing. She's against everything. And the Mo- and Lord said, that's all part of your job, son. Just cool it. And, Lord, and Moses said, all right. And boy, he took that, that rod over there and he was out there screaming in the hall. And we want water. We want water. And you know what he said? He said, all right, you rebels, here you some water. Plow! And he wiped that rock, and God opened up that rock, and water come out of like a fire hydrant, and not drowned in that crap. I'm telling you what, brother, it got all over. They was filling up their wash tub. Listen, God didn't have to do that. God could have let that water fall out of the sky. God could have let a spring bubble up out of the desert. You know why God told him to hit that rock? Because the Bible said that rock was Christ. He's in that Old Testament. And brother, in 1 Corinthians 10, they said our fathers drank out of that. That is a picture of Jesus Christ being smitten on the cross and the water of life gushes out and and feeds a hungry and thirsty world. Amen. And thank God for the law. Now you know a little bit later to prove how much God takes these types in the Old Testament and to prove you how that God don't like nobody messing up these types. A little bit later they run out of water again. And they start saying, Moses, Moses, we ain't got no water. We want water. We want water. More water. He said, Lord have mercy what you do with all that water come out the other day. They said, we're out. We ain't got none. He said, if you ladies didn't have to wash your hair every day, you'd have some water. And they said, well, it gets dirty. He said, it couldn't be dirty. You just don't do nothing and you just wash it and rinse it and wash it and rinse it and then you put cream rinse on all that. Is just greasing it up again because you've washed it all out where it's so dry and fizzy. It ain't got no body. You don't believe Moses told them all that, do you? <laughs> anyway, he did. The Lord reveals stuff to me like that. And he said, he said, and then you put that moose on it and grease it up again. Oh, won't you just let the real grease grease it up and quit wasting all water? And they said, because it looks better this way. And those are saying, well, I tell you what, I'm getting sick and tired of this. And boy, he had another headache. And he went to the Lord and he said, Lord, I'm going to hit her. I'm going to hit her. I'm, I'm in it, God, if you don't help me. You go, I'm going to take my rod here. And God, I'm going to hit her upside the head with it. And the Lord said, Moses, he said, give them some water again. He said, all right, I'm going to get it. I'm going to, I'm going to swing way around that way. When I hit the rock this time, and the Lord stopped him and said, don't you hit that rock again. Remember that? Ain't that right? And he said, why? Am I going to get to hit her? You going to let me hit her and make the water come out of her head? And the Lord said, no. You go over there and you do what, fellas? Speak to the rock. You know why God told him that? By the way, did you know Moses didn't get to go to the promised land? Because he messed up one of God's Old Testament types. He went over there in a fit of anger and he goes... And he hits that thing again and the Lord let the water come out. But he said, Moses, you shouldn't ought to have done that. You just became a Catholic. 
And Moses said, what do you mean? He said, they're the ones that believe they, they eat his body every Sunday and his body's broken every Sunday morning in what's called a mass. He said, he said, let me tell you something. That rock only has to be smitten once. And after it's smitten once, from then on, you don't hit it no more. You speak to it and the water comes out. He said, it's going to be hit one time on Mount Calvary. And one time and one time only. And from then on, anybody that wants water or life, they just speak to the rock. Listen, we don't crucify Jesus Christ every Sunday morning. He was crucified one time and one one time only, and if you want the water of life tonight, all you got to do is come down here and speak to the rock. Amen. Those are Old Testament types and shadows. I never will forget when I studied that story of Jacob's ladder. I was making me a big Bible study, boy. When I first got saved, I didn't hardly have no books. I remember I began to read and pray, and all I had was that little Matthew Henry commentary, and I'd read what it said, and sometimes it'd say something, sometimes it wouldn't, and boy, I began to read. And I thought, now listen, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? I read that story. And I heard an old preacher say one time, he said, you ought to be able to find Jesus on every page in that Old Testament. So I tried to do that. Every story, I'd look for Jesus. I come to that story about Jacob's ladder. I said, now where is he in this? Oh, Jacob's out there one day. He gets real tired. And he's laying down there and he wants to take him a nap. He said, boy, I am wore out. So he pulls up this big rock and makes him a pillow out of it. And he lays down and he has all kinds of dreams. Ain't no wonder. Man, have a, a pillar hard as a rock, a rock like that. I'd have nightmares too. But he had a dream that night and he dreamed this. He dreamed he saw a ladder and that ladder reached from earth to heaven. And he said God was at the top of it. And he said the angels of God were ascending and descending. Ascending and descending. And I read that. I have been saved very long. I said, God, what in the world? Where is Jesus in that? All of a sudden, that old King James Scripture began to click. That's why I know it's the Word of God. Other versions don't do that. I said, I've read that somewhere before. It's amazing how that thing fits. I said, I've read that thing somewhere before about that ascending and descending. And I couldn't remember where it was. And then the Lord took me back to John chapter 1 where I saw that there the story there of where Jesus was calling out his disciples. And he called those disciples they found no uh, oh, uh, si uh, Bartholomew and Nathaniel. And he called Nathaniel then in uh, John chapter 1. And the Lord looked at him and he said, Behold an Israelite in whom is no God. And Nathaniel said, Man, how'd you know me? And he said, Before you come over here when you were sitting under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathaniel said, You must be the Son of God. And he said, you think that's something, buddy? He said, you're going to see greater things than these. John 1, 51 said, Jesus told him, he said, hereafter you shall see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. I said, no, oh, my soul, that ladder was Jesus Christ back there in the Old Testament. And then I thought, after all, who is it that makes a way all the way from earth all the way to heaven? Who who is it that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life? No man comes to the Father except by me. Who is it that said, if any man try to climb up some other way, he's the same as a thief and a robber? I said, thank God, that was Jesus. And so we see one of them stories here tonight in Numbers chapter 21. If I don't ever get off this introduction, I'll bring you the message. Right quickly tonight, you look at it. Here in Numbers chapter 21, we see a picture of the dilemma of the world that is in, the world's in tonight. And we see the remedy that God provided. Number one, let me show you these three things quickly this evening. Number one, notice the resemblance between their disease and ours. You see, they had a disease back then. And it went like this. Here are all these people in the camps of Israel. Remember all these types I've been telling you? It's like that. And here are all these camps of Israel. And all these people in there, I don't like this. I don't like that. I'll tell you, I ain't crazy over God and I ain't crazy over Moses. 
Moses Appreciation Day. Baloney. He don't, we need to kick him out. I tell you what, I'm sick and tired of the way things is going. I'm just about ready to, I'm about ready to hang it up. Fully on this stuff. And the Lord heard him griping. And the Lord heard him complaining. I believe it really angers God when we as Christians complain. Brother, well, I was talking about a while ago about, you know, us complaining and belly aching. Brother, we ought to be the happiest people on this earth. God's been so good to us. So you know what the Lord done? The Lord sent these little serpents. And all of a sudden, these little snakes just started coming out everywhere. And they started biting people. And people started dying. What if, what if, what if I just slapped my hands here tonight? And there's about, oh, oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe, um, Maybe 700 snakes in this room. And there's little red ones, poisonous. And boy, they're just slithering around in here. You know, and you've seen them coming down this thing. And you say, oh, buddy, we'd have a lot of shouting tonight, wouldn't we? I'll guarantee you we'd have more shouting than we'd have. There'd be people back there on the back, Johnny, going up your britches legs. And, and I mean, going around, coming down across your neck. And buddy, they started biting people and people started falling out. You'd see somebody coming in like this. Their ankle would be swelled up that big around. There'd be a throwing up. Ah, I mean, old snake bite made them sicker than a dog. And brother, I mean to tell you, it got bad. And it got bad. Listen, that's a type of the problem the world's got tonight. That is a picture of sin. The Bible said in Romans 3.10, the devil is pictured as a serpent all the way through the Bible. And the Bible talks about the fiery darts of the wicked. And the Bible talks about sin. And it said at last it bites like a serpent and stings like an Error. And the Bible said, as it is written. See, there's things everywhere. That's the way sin is. That's the way sin is. It's universal. Every part of their camp was affected. Everywhere you'd go. You did not go to the east. You did not go to the west, to the north, to the south. Part of the camp of Israel, where there were people sick and dying. That's the way sin is tonight. You don't go to any town or country in this world, any street or city, where you'll not find sin. Sin. They put a picture of New York City or Los Angeles on TV and show the pretty lights. And all you go down into them streets, you go down into them ghettos, you go down, you'll find that people are dying by that old serpent, the devil, where they've been bit by sin. And I'm telling you, it's a picture of the dilemma that you and I are in tonight. You see what the Bible tells us? Sin is like a big giant python wrapped around a globe, squeezing it. That's where the devil has bent this world. You see, the Bible said the whole world, life and wickedness, and then it's fatal. Romans 6.23 said, the wages of sin is death. Many died from the snakes. You can't ignore them and cause them to go away. I can imagine some of them said, oh, these snakes are wonderful. They're not harmless. It's all in your mind. But, you know, drop dead, brother. I don't care. You couldn't get away from them. It was universal. It was fatal. And many people died from the snakes. And the Bible said, be sure your sin will find you out. And I'll tell you something else. Their diseases like ours in that it was no respect of persons. Them serpents didn't care who they bit. They'd bite the little child out there playing in the, in the, in the field. They'd bite grandma picking taters. They are uh, digging taters. They'd bite, uh, they'd bite, uh, papa, uh, brother out there sitting in the swing. They'd bite daddy. They'd bite mama. They bite anybody indiscriminately. Them snakes didn't just get mean people. They get little boys and girls. Let me tell you tonight, sin has no respect to a person. They'll get my kids. They'll get your kids. They'll get anybody. They don't care whose life it ruins unless something is done about it. Number two, notice the resemblance between their remedy and our remedy. See, there's a resemblance. The serpent on the pole was their remedy. Jesus on the cross is ours. You see, God, Moses went to God. And they come to Moses and they said, Moses, we're sick and tired of these snakes. Please, get rid of them. Get rid of them. Get rid of them. Please, pray for us, preacher. We're sorry. We shouldn't have talked about you like that. Help us. And so Moses went to God. And, Lord, and he said, Lord, I really wish you'd get rid of these serpents. I've been reading through their numbers and all those places. Boy, you seem like one time God would be getting ready to wipe Israel out. And Moses would say, Lord, now Lord, don't do that. And the next thing you know, Moses would say, kill them, God. And the Lord would say, nah, I better not do that. Somebody said, if Moses and God both would have got mad at them at the same time, there had never been a Jew left 
in this world. But it seemed like one of them was always taken up for him. Did you ever notice that? And boy, I'll tell you what old Moses said, Lord, could you get rid of the serpents? And my sisters are dying. And little babies are sick. And ain't nothing we can do about it. And the Lord said, all right, Moses, I'm going to give you a message. Now get you something to write with. And Moses said, all right, Lord. You, he, said, now, he said, now get this wrote down now. Because half the time when I speak to you preachers, you forget it. If you don't, if you don't really write it down, take notes. And he said, yes, sir. What do you want me to do? And the Lord said, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to make one of them serpents out of brass. And Moses said, what? He said, make a serpent of brass. And Moses said, Lord, why? He said, you just don't ask questions, boy. You just do what I tell you to. And Moses said, but Lord, you don't seem to understand them snakes. That's the last thing we need is another snake. I don't understand. He said, you're not supposed to understand. You're supposed to obey. That's a problem with you human beings. You're always trying to figure it out. You're always trying to think this way and that way. Just do what I tell you. Yes, sir. One serpent made of brass. What else, Father? And the Lord said, uh, put it on a pole. Put it on a pole. Got it. What else? He said, lift it up in sight of all the people. Lift up serpent on pole in sight of all people. You're right backwards in Hebrew, don't you? Like it. Something like that. Everybody did it up and down. <laughs> and anyway, boy, you tell I'm a scholar, can't you? I tell you what, old Moses said, but Lord, you sure that? I don't understand. He said, just listen to me, son. Just listen to me. And he said, I sure don't understand. It seemed like y'all put a lamb on that pole, Lord, to me. Or, or a dove at least. And, and the Lord said, no, serpent. Got to be a serpent. Why do we got to be a serpent? Well, you won't know. You'll be dead and gone a long time before anybody figures out why it's got to be a serpent. Old, old brother Danny's going to preach on one of these days at New Man and Baptist Church and them people are going to understand and you're not going to be able to understand it. And Moses said, well, oh, whatever. If that's what you want me to do, let's do it. And he said, you come to pass. It'll come to pass when you lift that thing up and you put it on that pole that if a man, if a serpent has bitten any man, it shall live. So old Moses, he made him a serpent of That'll be my watch. And boy, he put that serpent of brass on that pole. There it is. And boy, he took it down there. Now you know what there's a picture of? You know what that thing's a picture of? That is a picture of mine and your remedy. That was their remedy. That's a picture of mine and your remedy. Now I know what some of you are thinking. You're sitting there thinking, Brother Danny, why in the world did God tell him to make a serpent? It looks like he'd have told him to put a lamb, don't it? The lamb of God crucified. It looks like he'd have put a dove on there. Or something to picture the Son of God. No. He told him to put the serpent. You say, why? The serpent was the problem. Why did he tell him to put a likeness of a problem? I'll tell you why. Because when Jesus Christ, he was on that cross, he, what's our problem tonight? Sin. You know what Jesus Christ was like when he's on the cross? You know what he became when he's on the cross? Sin. That's a good sign man didn't wrote the Bible. Man would have never put a serpent on that pole. If man been writing that Bible, he would never have put the likeness of the problem on the pole. So he put that thing on there. You know what that shows us? Romans 8, 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sent in His own Son in the likeness of of sinful flesh and for sin condemn sin in the flesh. You know something? But I'll tell you what. It said he lifted him up on a pole. You know what that's a picture of? Anybody can figure that out. Now when Jesus Christ was on the cross, he became sin. You know what our problem is? Sin. You know what Christ became on the cross? Sin. In the likeness of sinful flesh. You know what else he done? He lifted him up. You know what that's a picture of? When them soldiers took that cross and they raised it up right there. And that was the remedy for the problem. Their problem was snake bite. Our problem snake bite. We get it from the devil. They got it from the serpent. Our, our immunization is to look to Jesus on the cross. Their immunization was to look to the serpent on the pole. 
By the way, let me clear something up right here. I hate to mess up a lot of people's praising, and I hate to mess up a lot of people's form of worship, but when Jesus made the statement, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me, Jesus Christ was not talking about a meeting where people get together and say, we're going to lift him up. That was not what he was talking about. The next verse said in the Bible, this he spake signifying his death on the cross you know what Jesus Christ meant when he said if I be lifted up I'll draw men unto me he meant when they lifted him up on that cross people get together and say we're just going to lift up Jesus we're going to lift up no we ain't going to crucify him that's what he meant when he said that we're going to be scriptural okay he didn't mean he didn't mean you know this kind of thing and we'll just lift him up lift him up I ain't going to lift him up brother he's done been lifted up one time he's crucified on the cross we're going to glorify him we're going to praise him we'll exalt him to high heaven but he's only been lifted up one time amen don't get all been out of shape now if you hear somebody say that but you know that's why I try to teach you here to be scriptural stick with the book stick with what the book says and brother I'll tell you what that was the only remedy God made God didn't make another one. that was the only one that he made by the way do you know what happened when they put nails in his hand Jesus never opened his mouth when they put stripes on his back he never opened his mouth when they put a crown of thorn on his head they never opened his mouth that was only one time he screamed out on the cross and that's when sin got laid on him and God turned his back. That means that the weight of sin laid on Jesus Christ when, G when God the Father turned his back was a greater pain than nails to his hands and a crown of thorns in his head, my friend. Oh, what he done for you and I. I remember I, remember I had a dream one time and I dreamed that I was shot the president. A long time ago. I'll never forget that. I either tried to or I, I did. And I remember they come and got me. I was thinking about Oswald or something. But I thought, oh my soul, what have I done? And boy, they put me in jail. And I said, they're going to execute me. And that was the awfulest feeling. I've had more pity on people like that ever since then. I, I thought, buddy, that'd be awful to be behind them bars and having no hope. And I woke up and the Lord started... Or take me and let him go free. I should have been crucified. I should have hung on the cross and died. I should have hung on the cross in this grace. But Jesus, God's Son, took my place. Thank God tonight, brother. His remedy was like our remedy. And the serpent got put on the pole. Jesus went to the cross. Got put up there for us. Number three, this will be last. Listen carefully. Notice the resemblance between the application of their remedy and our remedy. Look and live. Believe, see, and be saved. The only way that that thing would do them any good is if they had to look at it. Look to it. That's the only part they had. The only part you've got tonight is look to Jesus. Like that woman that had the issue of blood. She tried everything in the world. But when she come and touched the hem of his garment, that did it. See? Some of them probably said it was foolish. Some of them probably tried other things. I can imagine around the camp, old Moses went back and brought him up a poster. He took it to his wife, sister probably, Miriam. He said, see us, how about running off some of these on the copier? We're going to have a big service Saturday night. We're going to help these people out being bit by these snakes. They're dying all over the camp. God gave me a remedy. And she said, really? So they started running them things off. Buddy, y'all, them little old boys out all over town, putting them on telephone poles and everything. Big service. God has provided the remedy. Come Saturday night and be healed of your snake bites. Brother Moses will be there at 7 p.m. under the old gospel tent. And buddy, I mean, word got out all over. That first Saturday, that first week, everybody started talking. They said, well, what do you think about the preacher, what he's doing? They said, well, somebody said, well, uh, it sure ain't nothing else. Sure ain't doing no good. Let the man try. I mean, maybe he has got a word 
from God. Somebody else sitting down at the workplace said, ah, oh, I don't, you know him preachers. He's just taking advantage of sick people. Trying to cash in. He'll probably do down there begging for their money and trying to make them make pledges and take out promise offerings and he'll have Kentucky Fried Chicken buckets down there passing them around. And, oh, you know him bunch of crooks. Every time something happens, the preachers jump on him and want to make money. And somebody else said, well, I'll tell you one thing. Nothing else show ain't doing no good. I believe I'll go. And I said, man, you crazy. You going down there and listen to that fanatic? If you're bit by a snake, all you got to do is just think positive thoughts and believe in yourself. And, and you can overcome, man, if you'll just really, really believe that. What you got to do is we got to educate these kids on how to keep from getting snake bit. Education is the answer to this thing. And I'll tell you what we need to do is we need to train our kids. To, to, they're not really going to die. They just think they're going to die. And it's all in your mind. Well, I'll tell you one thing, buddy. He said, it ain't on my grandma's mind. They put her in the ground yesterday. And they said, well, she just thought she was dead. She really ain't dead. And uh, they said, it's all in your mind. You don't, you don't really got a snake bite. You just think you do. They said, man, you're about like nuts, ain't you? They said, no, I'm taking a course on it in college right now. And they're telling us that these snake bites are all in our mind. And they talked it up all week. And Moses and them couldn't hardly afford to get no TV time to air it, so they just kind of put up little flyers, wrote with a magic marker. And the people come. And that first night, there's a pretty big crowd. And Moses got up there and he got to preaching. And he had his pole back here. And boy, he took that thing up there and he said, Now, brethren and sisters, it has come to my attention that many of you have got snake bites huh? and you got it huh? and you got me it huh? and you shouldn't have been here complaining huh? and you uh, buddy I mean he let her roll for about 35 minutes that's right brother amen Oh, you saw you don't know all that stuff, brother. You got the craziest imagination. Well, you know where I get my sermons? From telling my daughter's Bible stories at night, brother. We get wild in our Bible story. But I'll tell you what, brother. I'm telling you old Moses, let her live. And he said, and now, God is going to give us the remedy. Anybody who's snake bed, just come on, brother Aaron, get us a song. Get number 81. Aaron, get up here. Aaron got up there, got number 81. Miriam hit the piano. Aaron's going to sing just as I am. That's in the old book. I don't know what number it is. It's our new book. But he got up there and he said, All right, it shall come to pass that if any man's bitten, when he beholds a serpent of brass, he shall live. Now, now come on down. He said, Get down here right now. If you've been bitten, come on down here and behold. That's all you got to do. And boy, they sung just as I am. And boy, about that time, somebody, everybody's looking at each other. You going to go? You going to go? I'm going to go. People's down there, their jaws is hanging way out out here where they've been down there in the strawberry patch. And one of them things reached up there and got them. And about that time, somebody come a crying. They said, Well, I'm going to die anyway. I might as well come on there. Her ankles swelled up about that big around. Here come the first man down the aisle. He said, I've tried everything I can try. I can't get rid of it. My buddies is dying. I believe you, Brother Moses. I believe in the living. About that time he looked up, and when his eyes met that serpent on, on that pole, it's just like a balloon. Boom. That thing went down. He said, Woo! Hallelujah! Woo! Oh, glory to God! He started going like this. Look at here. Woo! I've kicked the snake by. That's gone. It's gone. About that time, his old grandma's over here. She pulled out her handkerchief and started to give it a test. Wow! And boy, I mean, people started shouting. They started coming from everywhere. And it came to pass. Everyone that looked got better just like that. He said, look and live. Well, people quit coming. They dismissed the service that night. He said, we're going to meet here again tomorrow night. Bring all your friends and loved ones that's been. God has provided the remedy. The next day, people said, you going to go to that thing tonight? Well, I heard they getting healed down there. And I heard them snake bites are just, just zipping out. Said, oh, it's all in their mind. I bet, I bet as soon as they got home, their ankles swelled back up. As soon as they doubted Said, I believe. And I tell you what, somebody's little girl sitting there, and there's old daddy sitting at the breakfast table. 
Daddy's ankle swell up about that big round. He can't hardly eat. He's just eating some uh, chicken noodle soup, just real easy. Boy, he's just sick. He's been in there puking all night. I was on the couch. She said, Daddy, you're going to die. He said, Honey, I'm not going to die. I'm a strong man. She said, Daddy, I know you are. People's dying all over the camp. Why don't you go here, Brother Moses, with me tonight? He's got a serpent down there on a pole. He said, That's the last thing we need is another serpent. I ain't going down there on a serpent. That's crazy. That's ridiculous. That's the world's attitude toward Jesus Christ. Is that's ridiculous. That's crazy. I don't want to hear that junk. I tell you what, you may re- you may decide to reject it, friend, but that is the only remedy God Almighty will ever make for your sins to be forgiven. And if you decide you don't want Jesus Christ here tonight, brother, you God will never make another way for you. Don't sit around and wait on God to make another door. There ain't gonna be no other door. God made a remedy, and if you don't look at it, it's your fault now. It's not God's. So all day, little boy went out and some of his friends said, "Hey." Heard you was going to that fanatic meeting tonight. All them people's crazy. I know an old lady down here, 34th and Vine, selling some potions. <laughs> he said, I went down there. He said, I drunk some of that stuff. I didn't know if it was day or night. He you know all that stuff for him. He went down there. So I believe I'll try some of that stuff. He goes down there. This little tent, she's got her hand drawn out on the front yard. Like this. And it says, Reverend Sister Teresa, or something like that. Come on in. And there she sits in there. Come in. She's got a thing over her head like that. No robe. She's stirring something there. There's smoke bubbling coming out. Here he comes in. That old fellow comes in there. His ankle swelled up. And he said, Sis, you got anything for snake bites? She said, Oh, yes. You can just drink some of this. Little baby bottle full of it. And you just drink this tonight. And I'm going to have to have $35 in advance. You drink this and come back tomorrow. Well, she knew he'd be dead, you know, and she'd have his $35. Selling him some water, sugar in it or something like that. And he says, yes, I really believe you. They tried psychiatrist. They went down there. What's your problem, sir? What does it look like my problem is? See my ankle? And the guy said, now listen, friend. Did you have a bad childhood? He said, let's, let's go back into your past. Now that sounds stupid, but that's what people doing now trying to get rid of sin. He said, oh, Mr. So-and-so, I have diagnosed your case and I have found your problem. Your daddy did not get you that train set when you were in the third grade. And ever since then, you've had a complex. That's why your ankle is swelled up like it is. You must learn to think positive thoughts. You must learn to feel good about yourself. I mean, just you, you need some self-esteem. Boy, you, your ankle ain't swelled up. He said, man, you could have fooled me. It's about to kill. No, don't confess it. The more you confess it, the more it will swell. You must believe that it's not there. You must believe. He said, oh, good night, Doc. You, you're out of your mind. He said, now that's your problem. You've got to have faith. You've got to believe in yourself and reach your human potential. And you can do anything. You can be an Olympic star and skate like them people on the Olympics. He said, skate? I can't even walk. He said, but you, it's because somebody dropped you on your head when you was real little and you ain't never been right since. He'd hobble out of there and say, I ought to be shot for going to a quack like that. And he went home. And his little girl said, Daddy, you going to hear Preacher Moses tonight? Are you going to hear him? Are you going to hear him? He said, oh, honey, I told you, I don't want to hear that fanaticism discussed in this class. And he heard his little girl go in the room in there. She said, oh Lord, please touch daddy's heart. He's just stubborn and proud and mean. And God, I know that you can touch him and save him if he'd go down there and hear Brother Moses preach. Oh, he could hear his little girl in there praying. And the hurting started getting worse. Finally, that old boy's heart started breaking. He started, you know what he figured out? He figured out it's not what you know. It's who you know. Do you know that? Listen, people. The night I got saved, all I'd done was look to Jesus. That's it. I didn't know one verse of Scripture. I didn't know, I didn't know the Roman road from Interstate 40. 
honest. I didn't know. I did not know what, any doctrine. I didn't have heard of the Antichrist. I'd never heard of the Rapture. I'd never heard of the Tribulation. I'd never heard of dispensations. I'd never heard of eternal security. I'd never. I didn't know none of that stuff. But I went home that night, and I knew the Lord had took my sins away. It's not what you know. I had a boss man one time, boss man one time right before I got saved, and he could stay out and get drunk, and he wouldn't come in until 11 or 12 o'clock in the day and lay out every Monday. Nearly. One time I asked him, I said, Walt, great big old guy named Walt. I said, Walt, how in the world do you get away with that? Anybody, I didn't fire anybody else but laid out every Monday like that. He said, Danny, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And that's the truth. He didn't have a third grade education. But boy, he knew the right people. And he knew the boss. And he'd just say, hey boss, you know, I had a little rough time last night. And he'd just say, okay, come on in. And I ain't never forgot that. When I first got saved, I didn't know Greek. I didn't know Hebrew. I still don't. I know people, or I've heard of people, who know Greek, know Hebrew, know supposedly Bible history, and the Holy Lands, and the River Euphrates, and the River Jordan, and all that stuff, but don't know Jesus. It's not what you know, my friend. It's who you know. We got kids in this church, 12 and 13 years old, that's ready and knowing they're going to heaven when they die. And then you got PhDs in colleges and universities that don't know they're going to heaven. When you, you know what that means? It's not what you know. It's who you know. You know Jesus? You've got your sins took care of. They're gone. They're gone. I remember, I, you wouldn't believe it. When I, you've heard me tell it before. When I first got saved, I... I, I couldn't pronounce. I thought an epistle was an apostle's wife for all I knew. I didn't know what an epistle was. People said the epistle was there. I thought, what is that? I remember when I first started hearing people say pew. They said back here on the third pew. I said, pew? I remember, I remember that distinct. I said, what is a pew? I didn't know what a pew was. I called them bleachers. <laughs> really? I really did. Well, you know, all we done is play ball and basketball. I remember I'd come in and I'd say, boy, mom, we had a great service. The stands was full. <laughs> and it finally hit me that people meant pew. They are talking about the seats. When they said pew, I called Malachi and Malachi. I did. I called Habakkuk, Habakkuk, you know. I'd say it's over there in the book of Habakkuk. And, you know, and it's Malachi 310. Bring all the tithes in the storehouse. You know, all that kind of stuff. But I tell you what, brother, I, we, I didn't know what I, I didn't know a lot, but I knew the Lord. I was like that little old boy who's sitting there whittling at the service station, you know. He's sitting there like this, and a big fine Cadillac pulls up, and this businessman in the suit got out, and he comes running over and he said, Young man, which way does this road go? The old boy's sitting there saying, I don't know. And about that time, the old man said, what about this road down here? Which way does it go? The little boy said, I don't know. We didn't like that. And the man said, what about this other road? Where does it go? The little boy said, I don't know. Just kept a wheeling like that. And the man said, man, don't you know nothing? And the little boy said, I know I ain't lost. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and buddy, it's not what you know. It's who you know. It's like that guy come, stopped into the service station, come in there, got him a cup of coffee and a honey bun, and went out and he said, which way was I coming when I go in here? When I come in here? You know, that's where the world is, brother. I mean, they don't know where they're coming or going. They know a whole bunch, but they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses had that last service that night. They begged that old daddy to go. And they begged him and they begged him and they begged him. And the witch doctor hadn't worked. And the psychiatrist hadn't worked. And finally, Mama come in there and said, Honey, why don't you go just one night for her sake? He said, All right. I'm going to be dead tomorrow anyway. The way this thing's swelling. Little old youngin, the least I can do, is do it for her. And the devil said, ain't you afraid of them guys that work a life at you? He said, I'll be dead anyway. Don't matter. He come to the end of his road. That's where you got to come to. you got to come to a place where you, you, you've had it, you've tried everything, you, you, you realize if God don't help you, you're a goner. And that night he stood there and old Moses preached. And the more Moses preached, the more sense it made. And the more he told about that serpent on that pole, that old boy's heart started softening. Man, he started saying, well, maybe he's right. Maybe he's right. 
About that time Aaron got up and sung the same song. Just as I am without one plea. That thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come. And he said, come down. He lifted that thing up again. Here come a few people. That man saw that it wasn't emotionalism. That it wasn't just a, a, of an emotional stir or something in the flesh. He realized it was something real. And something really was happening there. And his little girl reaching up saying, Daddy, please, I don't want you to die. Daddy, I want you to live with me and Mommy. Boy, that was all he could take. And here come one foot out. Here come the other one. And down the aisle that old boy went. Here's his wife and little girl right behind him just a bawling. That old boy looked down there and his friends sent back are sniggering, saying, look at old Joe down there. Joe's gone to get religion. You know, go crazy thing down there. Boy, we'll ride him at work tomorrow. Man, is he going to pay for this. He, that boy making a fool out of himself. He got way down there and about the time he looked up, his ankle got strength. All that sickness went away. And boy, God changed him completely. But he got strength. He hugged his wife. He picked up his little girl and said, oh, thank God. And she was so happy and hugged his neck. That scene's been repeated many, many times in revival meeting and church services for an old man that was stubborn against God and held out many, many years but finally come down to an old-fashioned altar. Hey, listen, listen, you daddy's here tonight. You want to make your little girl the happiest little girl in the world and your wife the most proud wife in the world? Get saved. Look to Jesus Christ. He said, look to Him. The Lord said, look unto me and be you saved. Just like they looked at that serpent on that pole, you've got to come and look to Jesus Christ and the split second you look to Him your sins are gone just like that turn to John chapter 3 just a second and I'll read this and I'll close many of you remember the night Brother Tater Sheehan walked down the aisle down there to tent he looked he lived many of you were here in our church and you saw people sitting right here in this room come down to this altar they looked and they lived. Now you're going to see John 3.16 in a different light than you've ever seen it before right now if you'll look at this. See, everybody looks at John 3.16 and thought, thanks, my, what a wonderful verse. But you look at the verses right before it. Look at verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up on the cross that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And that's the story that God used to lead into the greatest verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. He became the likeness of sinful flesh that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's stand and bow our head. While our heads are bowed and eyes are closed tonight, they're coming to get us a song. Remember the Roy? God's speaking to your heart tonight. Maybe there's somebody here in this service this evening. There's never really, really been a time when you look to Jesus Christ. While they're getting us a song tonight, just like in days of old, when they come and looked at that serpent on the pole, you can come and look to Jesus Christ here tonight. If you don't know you're saved beyond a shadow of a doubt, why don't you come tonight? Will you quit worrying about what your friends are going to do? What good is it going to do what your friends say when you're dead and in hell? What good is it going to do? Maybe there's a Christian here tonight. You just want to slip down here and pray for somebody that you know that maybe is here tonight who needs to come. Or maybe somebody who's not here. The invitation is for everybody, not just for those that are not saved. If you need to come, you come right now. Oh, Father, Lord, it was so simple, that remedy that you provided. It was so simple that people stumbled, stumbled over it like they're doing now with the cross of Calvary. I pray, Lord, that you'd open somebody's eyes here tonight. I've tried my best to make the gospel as clear and plain as I can possibly do it here tonight. And Lord, use this message, whether it goes out 
in the tape ministry, radio, wherever it goes, and here tonight. I pray, O oh God, that you'd reach souls for Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. To you I'll give. Tis recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look at everybody. Live. Look and live, my brother. Live. Amen. Look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded in his word. Hallelujah. Amen. It is only that you look and live. Page 268. Number 268. We're going to sing that second verse. Many have come already tonight. Maybe you need to come. Maybe you've never really looked to Jesus Christ. Maybe there's never been a time in your life when you've looked to Him. Will you do it? Let's sing. I have a message full of love. Hallelujah. A message, oh my friend, for you. Tis a message from above. Hallelujah. Jesus said it and I know it is true. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. That's good. It's recorded in His Word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. Go ahead, brother. Let's say it. Life is offered Amen. to you, hallelujah. Have all looking and living tonight. Eternal life thy soul shall have. Amen. If you'll only look to him, hallelujah. Look to Jesus who alone can save. All right, here we go, everybody. Look at me, my brother, live. Look to Jesus, Jesus now and live. Is recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that some you look and live. Let's sing again. Somebody come I please. will tell Amen. you how I came. Yes. Hallelujah. To Jesus when he made me whole. Was believing on his name. Hallelujah. I trusted and he saved my soul. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. It is recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. That's how simple it is tonight. That's how simple it is. Just look and live. A lot of times people say, well, these little old kids that get saved, I don't believe a kid can understand. There's kids in that congregation could look at that serpent. I guarantee you there's little eight, nine-year-old kids walked out of that crowd. When they beheld the serpent of brass, they lived. I'll guarantee it. I'll guarantee you they got well. That's all. If you've got enough sense to look to Jesus Christ, you've got enough sense to be saved. If you realize you've got a problem with sin, you realize you've got sin in your heart, and you look to Jesus Christ, that's all you have to do. One more verse. One more verse. Come on. I have say. a message from the Lord. Hallelujah. It is only that I'll give. Say it's recorded in His Word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and Everybody live. Everybody say, Look at me. Yeah. My brother live. Look to Jesus now and live. Is recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. Amen. All right. That all be, I'll all, we'll sing right now.